Hello, everybody. My name is Carmine Remy. Thank you for joining this webinar. Today, I'll talk about uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, Ubuntu, and to some degree, Canonical as well. This is our first in a series of webinars. In this series, uh, we will cover uh, many different aspects of artificial intelligence and machine learning as it applies to uh, Ubuntu and how you can take advantage of some of the tools that we're using to help you on your journey. Uh, today, just as a level set and sort of as an introduction to this uh, broad category, um, we will use this information in this presentation just to ease into some of the concepts and some of the high level things that you might need to be aware of so that the following webinars make sense. So with that, uh, here's uh, some of my information and how you can reach me if you have questions about this webinar or other aspects uh, of things presented here. More than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, with that, let's go ahead and jump into the basics. So what's the difference between AI, machine learning, and deep learning? So this is a very high level view. Um, but artificial intelligence is, uh, you know, a very broad uh, category of stuff, a part of uh, computer science. Um, but it's a, a term to describe the capability of a machine to imitate intelligent human behavior. Um, and, and arguably, uh, to some degree, I've, I've heard it said that with artificial intelligence, uh, until a machine actually uh, uses it, uh, then it no longer becomes sort of artificial. At that point, you could argue that it's sort of real intelligence once you've actually codified something in such a way that it's now into production. But in any case, artificial intelligence is just that. It's sort of outside of the human beings. With machine learning, um, that's, you know, again, sort of a subset of AI focused on the design of algorithms that can learn. And so that's the, the primary focus of machine learning is, you know, how do you create these algorithms such that a machine you know, can learn and allow it to adjust and improve over time and all that kind of good stuff. With deep learning, that's sort of a deep set of that, and it's more inspired by how the brain works. So you'll, you'll hear neural networks used a lot. Um, here, I just sort of introduced the term artificial neural networks, as opposed to the neural networks that you might have in your brain. Um, and that's what a big part of deep learning is, is defining these using pre-existing and already defined uh, neural networks that you can then feed a bunch of data into and sometimes uh, a massive amount of data into these neural networks to then allow it to learn and allow it to choose. Very similar to how uh, an infant might learn how to speak someday and how to organize its thoughts and its, its physical body to actually utter the right words. Similarly, when you design these neural networks, uh, it involves choosing some weights, some biases, choosing which, which input to look at and when and uh, looking at the end result to see whether or not, as an example, if you fed it a million pictures of oranges, you know, what is the accuracy of it uh, in predicting that there is an orange in this image? So there's a lot of mathematics behind this, and we'll talk about some of those components later as to um, some of the things that you might want to have that will make it so that machine learning and deep learning becomes a reality in your organization. Before we get into too many details, this is just a very high level view of the training process, uh, something that you might do. Uh, this particular training process uh, involves an edge cloud that you might have. So that might be something you might see in the IoT space, Internet of Things, and or in the telco space uh, where towers at the edge distributed around the country. You may or may not experience that in your own endeavors. You might just have a private cloud or you might be just using this in a public cloud or you might be using all three. In this example here in particular, if you have an edge cloud with maybe uh, cameras or a cell tower or some other aspect where data is coming in. So it starts with defining a model. And we'll get to what that means. Uh, invariably, that's going to mean software, whether it's in Python or Java or C++. But you will define a model. And there's lots of examples out there of how to define these models. Um, but a lot of them, or most of them, or majority of them, are uh, using the Ubuntu operating system, just sort of as your command line. Some of these are just in Python, and so arguably these could run anywhere, particularly with the CPU. But when you get down to the GPU and trying to use your general purpose graphics processing unit from companies like NVIDIA or AMD or others, then that's where some of the drivers that we provide uh, make uh, good use in terms of uh, getting efficient uh, model training happening. But in any case, you define a model, 
Uh, and then once you've done that, you want to be able to train that model. And the training the model is where you'll feed it uh, the training data. There's a lot of information and a lot of tools out there in terms of how you actually get data from your data lake. So this could be whether it's logs, files from your website to uh, log files from your applications to anything else that you're doing, uh, images, pictures, voice, data from financial transactions. All of that information may arrive in your data lake. And then from that information in your data lake, you'll need to learn at some point how to massage that data into a format that you can then consume it at space in parallel in the, the training the model step. And a lot of the times, the training the model step, you'll have a goal or a target of what the accuracy rate is, particularly for supervised learning. And I won't go into supervised learning versus unsupervised learning um, and other forms of learning yet uh, in this presentation. That'll be the subject of another webinar. But there's lots of different ways that you can go about the training the model approach. Once you have it trained and when it reaches your criteria for success, then yes, where you have that trained model. At that point, you'll a lot of times go and deploy that into production, assuming you've already developed applications to take advantage of that trained model. Alternatively, and or in addition to that, you might decide to, to share that model and let other developers, researchers, other people who might want to use and, and develop models on top of that take advantage of what you just trained. So as an example, if you're looking at images and you've developed a model for uh, images, uh, pictures, if you will, then you might de define a particular model that is very good at uh, identifying edges, lines, circles, squares, etc. And it does identify all of the different pieces that would make up the different objects in that picture. That could take a lot of work. You could just focus on just that one uh, aspect of deciding what this picture is comprised of, feed it a whole bunch of images. Once you've done that, and once you now have a trained model, you can then decide, you know what, I, I, I don't need to do that training again. I can save myself or my coworkers the time to train that aspect of the model. And instead, you know, just use the already trained model. In any of those situations, at some point, it'll get leveraged. You'll want to deploy it either to a private cloud or to a public cloud or to an edge cloud. And there, you don't need access to all of that data that you trained it with. You already have a model with the weights and biases already defined and the connections in that neural network already defined. Now you just need to feed it, as an example, a new image or a new sentence. And uh, it'll just use how it's been trained to then give that prediction or the inference as to what's happening and what's going on. So that's the high level view of the training process. One of the things we didn't cover here is uh, with all of these arrows, one of the things that you might be asking yourself, well, how do I go from defining the model to training the model to all these other steps? And that can be a manual process, or you can take advantage of uh, DevOps practices to help you go from one mode to another mode in a highly automated uh, no humans involved kind of uh, process to go from once you've defined the model to then taking it through the rest of the process. And again, before we get into more uh, details about some of the components and tools you might use, here's just a coding example that shows using TensorFlow, which is one of the libraries and frameworks we'll talk about, as well as Keras, one of the libraries built on top of that, which again, we'll go into more details. But here's in a, could be a single line, it's just been for readability put onto multiple lines uh, of creating a multi-layer model. If you look right here, it's creating a sequential uh, model, a sequential uh, layers where the data will be fed in from one into the other. And, and at the end of this, in terms of your success criteria, that's where you'll determine whether or not this model is successful or not. That's effectively in a single line defining a rather complex uh, set of uh, of layers in, in, in your model, in your machine learning model, which is pretty exciting. And that's what Curis kind of does for you. It uh, simplifies some of the lower level APIs that you might use otherwise. OK, so this is what the code looks like. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Let's now get into some of the key components.